Test. All right, good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, John. All right, uh, again, welcome to the WITEA conference. Uh, in my opinion, and I'm a little biased, this is the best one of the year. Um, so I got one person. Woohoo. Okay. Uh, real, real quick, before we turn it over to Scott, who we're all very excited to hear. Um, I want to remind everyone about the Bob Radabaugh grant. Uh, That's a $500 grant for you guys to uh, develop a new innovative uh, program or uh, project within your, within your classes. It's a great opportunity to get kind of that kickstart money if you're trying to get something that your director's a little on the fence about. You can throw in that $500, they really help it out. Uh, keep in mind, if you do win that grant, uh, it is an expectation that you come back and do a, do a session on it and let us know what you did to help other people get those ideas so we can continue to better our programs. Uh, along with that, we are introducing brand new this year is the Classroom Vegas grant, uh, where you can get that, uh, you can get $150 that'll go towards anything you want to help grab those kids' attention and get them into your room to see what you're doing. Uh, if you want more information about Classroom Vegas, uh, James Sullivan has stepped in for one of our sessions that, unfortunately, the presenter couldn't make it. Uh, so he stepped up and he's doing an entire session uh, starting at 9 o'clock in Gala 1 and 2 about Classroom Vegas. So if you have no idea what I'm talking about, go check that one out if you can. And if you don't have a chance to get there, remember you always have access to the uh, remote or virtual side of this after the conference as well. Um, so I'm not up here talking too much. I'm going to introduce our board real quick. Uh, we have myself, Marcus Sullivan. I am your current WITEA president. Yay. All right. If you're not excited about that, I'm done after this conference, so it's okay. Um, then we have our current past president, uh, John Garrett, sitting up here. He is also our conference uh, coordinator for, for this one, so if you have an issue, talk to him. Um, our current president-elect, which is uh, Cheyenne LaViolette. Our treasurer, Ross Short, who is also our in-house IT guy. He's currently at work making sure that all the camera stuff works before Scott gets up here. I'm his, I'm his test subject right now. Um, then we have the lovely Francine, who is downstairs at registration, working incredibly hard already, which if you haven't met her, you will when you register. Um, then we have our secretary and communications liaison, which would be Courtney Sullivan. Our TSA director, uh, who is not here because she is currently very busy setting up for their conference next week, and that is Jennifer Smith. Our Skills USA director, Carmen Warner. Our college rep, Scott Callahan, who I don't think has made it here yet. He will be here today at some point. And then our new OSPI staff member on the board is Katie Daly. And then we have two open positions on our board for a STEM teacher rep and an STS teacher rep. So if you're interested in finding out what we do on a board, that is a great entry point um, to where you get a, uh, get a, get a voice uh, to talk about the teacher side of it and help bring, bring that additional voice to what we're trying to, uh, trying to change for you guys. Um, and there is a presentation on that that Luke Kelleher, our historian, is putting on uh, later today at 2 o'clock. So if you are interested in that, please stop by that. And he has a lot more information than I do for it. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce our Skills USA students uh, real quick. 
and they're going to come up and say a few words. Good morning, respected advisors, teachers, and instructors, and CTE leaders. My name is Jasmine, and this is Diego. We are here representing SkillsUSA Washington, and we are the advocates for the collaborative spirit that unites all of our CTS hubs. You're right, Jasmine. <clears throat> Today we are here to celebrate our collective achievements in technical education. We owe our successes and dedication to the expertise of everyone in this room. You are not just educators, you are the architects of our future. This year, we have seen outstanding growth and success across all of our programs, thanks to your efforts. Your commitment has empowered students across Washington State, instilling confidence, technical understanding, and helping establish career clarity along with leadership skills, and a strong sense of community involvement. Your ability to adapt and innovate has kept our programs at the forefront of technical education, despite the challenges that we faced. Resilience and dedication have ensured that our students continue to receive the highest quality education. Our goal is to deepen the collaboration and break down the silos between all career and technical student organizations. In Washington, there are eight in total. With the support from instructors like you, we can continue to further grow and evolve. Take Skills USA, for example. With membership growth in 2023 for over 1,000 student members in all three sectors, middle school, high school, and college post-secondary, and over 30 new industry partnerships to connect students on site at our championships with real job opportunities. We are all making a difference and we are all working together to close the ever present skills gap. This is where I wanna take a moment and say thank you to all of your hard work for the results and milestones that we have all just mentioned being met. We have all of you to thank. We also want to extend our heartfelt thanks to the CTE directors and coordinators. Your vision and leadership has been instrumental in navigating the complex landscape of technical education, ensuring our programs not only excel, but also transform lives. To all of our advisors and instructors, we recognize your tireless work. You are the mentors, the guides, and the inspiration of our future workforce. Your dedication to nurturing and fostering the talent is a cornerstone of our future success. Let's commit to continuing our collaborative efforts, sharing best practices, and supporting each other. By working together, we can ensure that CTE in Washington State remains a beacon of excellence. Let's remember that our collective efforts have the power to shape the future. Together, we create a legacy of skilled professionals who are ready to meet the challenges of tomorrow. Thank you for your commitment, your passion, and your belief in the transformative power of CTE. Here's to a future where, together, we continue to make a difference in the lives of our students and communities that we serve. Together, we are stronger, and together, we are career and technical education. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Good morning. Again, I'm John Garrett, your current past president. And so, without further ado, I'm our keynote speaker today hails to us from Olympia, the Olympia School District and Capitol High School. And a man who needs no introduction, Scott Ledoux. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm hoping to uh, give you something to take away today. And I want to just say that I'm humbled to be here. And I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the family, by blood and by relationship, and part of the relationship would be obviously you. And this family uh, is what has allowed me to become who I am. So if it's awesome, thank you for your help in that. If it's not awesome, that's my issue. I also want to thank my wife, who uh, tolerates me when I'm uh, intolerable and helps me be the best person I can be. So thank you for being here. All right. Plus is me. I teach at Capitol High School. I've been there for 27 years. I teach, teach arts and tech. And um, teach these three courses. I've taught a lot of different other courses and so on. Uh, but arts and media is, is my, my mainstay. Today's theme is heroes and stories. Everyone is a hero of their own story. So how do we help kids get to know their own story? How do we get to know our students? Getting to know 
uh, our heroes in training is the way I like to say it. We need to help students with their, their why, looking at the meaning of life, their journey, their what, being really good at something, the how, how to make a difference, serve something bigger than themselves. Let's examine an example. So what's my story? Uh, why am I standing here? Two stories to make a point. And some takeaways, hopefully, that you'll like. Story one, across America. So why am I here? Now, not here. We're like, you know, we're talking big ex existential why. A journey only I can go on. Now, the story I'm going to tell you is me when I was you know, pretty young. So I didn't know these deep philosophical existential things at that point. But let's set the stage. 1980. Before I was 10 years old, no worries. My parents get divorced. After 10 years old, worries. Looking for structure to latch onto. That's essentially what happened. When the family dissolved, and I love my mom and dad, they're wonderful people, but the family structure dissolved and I didn't have a structure. So I started looking what to latch onto. I needed guidance and I needed feedback, as we all do. So I want to be somebody. Sports was an easy option. I'm from Green Bay, you know? So if you don't know the Packers, it's kind of a big deal. Um, I did mow Bart, you know, Bart Starr's lawn, so if you don't know who Bart Starr is, he was a quarterback for Super Bowl one and two. Super nice guy. Uh, his wife's amazing, too. Uh, my brother found his keys in a snowbank one day. Small town. So I decided to use sports as a thing to latch on to. So I played football, basketball, soccer, did track. Uh, and it was my structure, and I got feedback. I was gifted with abilities, and I got a lot of positive feedback, and that felt good. Then, seventh grade, I take an art class, and this guy named Larry Seiler... Um, shows me the structure b behind art and music. And my world cracked open again. I found that music with a message, somebody who has something to say bigger than themselves, is pretty awesome. The band Kansas and U2 were the ones that kind of really jumped out. And I was like, what? So seventh grader, heads open, so I got sports. This whole music and, and, and spiritual stuff is really powerful. So I want to dig into that. Flash forward to sophomore year, 1985. I'm now captain of all the teams I'm on. Why? Because I, if I'm told to do something, I do it. I'm kind of like Forrest Gump. So don't get the, you know, the thing of like, uh, no, it's more like, okay, I just do it. Run fast, run fast. And uh, that uh, worked well for me, and so therefore I would be selected to represent the team, which I felt very fortunate to do. Summer, um, I was working out every day, Walter Payton-style workouts. Now, he was my hero. I rooted for the Packers and Walter Payton whenever the Bears played the Packers. If you don't know, it's the number one rivalry in football, or the oldest one, we should say. And Walter Payton is an amazing person, was an amazing person. And so his workouts were legendary. People would team up with him, and they couldn't handle it. So I was like, I want to be him. I'd dress up in winter clothing and run the hills in the woods in June, you know, just because Walter did that. I could also dunk. Now, if you look at me, it's like, I can't dunk now. But I worked out enough that I improved my, improved my vertical leap because I wanted to help my team. I did our jump balls for our basketball team. We had a 6'6 center, and I could out-jump him. So I'd walk up to the person on the other side, and they'd look at me, well, look down at me, and I'd be like, I won half the jumps. So i just look at him like, hmm, watch out, buddy. I could bench press 240 pounds. These are all indicators of the fact that I wanted to improve my process to be the best person on my teams. Then, the summer of 85, I see Live Aid. Back to this music and power thing. I also, uh, a group of people come together to sing against apartheid in South Africa, and an album comes out called Artists Against Apartheid, and I was like, whoa. Again, the injustice of what was going on in South Africa, but singing about that and bringing it to people's consciousness. Um, sophomore year, I became class president. Uh, that was a big thing, and I felt very fortunate that my peers felt that I was worthy to be in that position. Um, but one day, during football practice, I get this voice in my head basically says, why are you here? That deep question. And I then get clipped by uh, a, an offensive lineman coming across and just knocks me out, you know, rings my bell. And I get up and I'm like thinking of this question. I couldn't answer it. Um, I went to Catholic school, all guys Catholic school. And so next week I'm in mass and I'm just kind of sitting there and I have this vision, not like a cinematic, beautiful vision. It's more like a going, if I can't answer this question, I can't move forward. And I'm a bit stubborn kind of like Forrest Gump. So if, you know, I can't answer this, what am I going to do about it? So I quit sports and I pursued deeper things. My principal thought I was on drugs. He said so. He's like, 
you know, when somebody quits things they love, there's something going on. I'm like, no, I just need to find a meaning of life. And he's like, okay. And I was on a journey. From the album, Artists Against Apartheid, there's a statement. If you don't stand for something, you'll go for anything. And I was like, what do I stand for? i got to figure this out. Like, now. I was selected for my school to represent us at Badger Boy State. Now, in the States, you, it's basically setting up what you know, uh, Congress looks like, what political stru- structure in the state look like. So in Wisconsin, it's Badger State, so we're Badger Boy State. So I went there, and I, <laughs> there's two parties, essentially. But I ran as a third party because I didn't like what was going on. I wanted to do something real with all the energy we had there. Uh, the petty politics of, like, just grip and grin and try to, hey, vote for me because. Like, I don't know you. I don't know what you stand for. So um, I gave a speech, and I got a standing ovation from everybody in the room. And I was like, wow. That was power of trying to put your finger on something that's meaningful and powerful. And that feedback was an adrenaline rush. And I was like, okay, this, this is something. So there were also heavy moments, moments sophomore year. Um, one of our classmates uh, committed suicide. practice this. I didn't get through it yesterday, the first time, but I got through the second time. Thank you for your patience. So, after this happened, you know, here's my locker, this was his locker. The student to the right of me, who was a smart ass, I need that levity, um, kind of noticed and said, hey, um, I have a book you should read. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Yeah, so his locker was there. So moving on. I noticed that people are being bullied in school. People are starting to drink. So sophomore year, some people are going, hey, this is cool. We're the cool kids. And, you know, I felt like I was friends with everybody, but I see this group doing that, and I didn't like it. Um, so I decided um, to write an article in the school newspaper, which the adults in the building thought was awesome, but... I was not re-elected class president the next year. Let's just say that. I was the, I was the joke at parties if somebody wasn't drinking. And I don't drink, and, um, but I didn't have a problem with that with, with other people. Okay. So, why are you here? The question comes back again. That book that he gave me was called A Walk Across America by Peter Jenkins. Peter Jenkins was looking for the real America. Now, this is the early 70s. The funny thing is it's still relevant now. I wanted to do what Peter did. He ended up walking across the country, meeting the people of the country. And when he would run out of money, he would work. He would work for a few months, earn enough money, and he and his dog would continue the walk. And they wrote a book about it. Um, also, in April of 1977, if you get National Geographic, he had a camera he got from them when he stopped in D.C. And he took pictures and wrote an article about it. It's really powerful. Um, so I wanted to walk across the U.S. I wanted to find out more about my country, myself, and my purpose. I'm like, yeah, I want to do this. So after reading the book, one day in class, a teacher says, anybody here ride a bicycle? I'm the only person who raised my hand. And I just bought a specialized stump jumper. Now, for those who ride bikes, this is 1986. So mountain bikes are pretty new, and uh, nobody knew what they were, but it was so cool. I loved the thing. Um, So the teacher hands me a pamphlet, and it's about bike aid. So the summer before was live aid. In 1986... Two students at Stanford found an organization called the Overseas Development Network, and they wanted to have an event to raise money for um, basically self-help around the world, including the U.S., where people say, hey, we don't need a handout. We know what we need. We just need $1,000 of parts and so on to build a well. Can you send us the stuff so we can build a well ourselves? And so ODN founded Bike Aid to raise money. So bike across the U.S., 3,600 miles, mid-June to mid-August. I was like, this is amazing. I could do this. It would help self-help uh, projects, something meaningful, bigger than me. So I got permission from my parents. It's the 80s. I signed up. I raised the $1,700 you have to raise to be accepted into the organization. And uh, I figured I could do a few things on this trip. I could support a cause. I could find out more about my country. And I could uh, find out more about myself and my purpose. 
So I had a hero that I really thought I could find. Now, remember, I'm 16. So I'm like, I'm going to bike across the United States. There's only a few people in the country. I'm going to find this guy, Carrie Livgren. Where, who's Carrie Livgren? He wrote songs for Kansas, right? Carry on, Wayward Son, which is kind of my anthem as a sophomore. I'm like, what? There'll be peace when you are done. Carry on. Whew. Dust in the wind. So his songs connected with me, and uh, it was about searching for the meaning of life. And I'm like, this is really cool. I got his autobiography, and I figured I would read his book on the trip, and I would find him in Kansas. <laughs> okay? I was biking through Kansas. So uh, 1986, June 13th, I go to Chicago where my best friend lives. Uh, I sleep overnight there. That night is the Amnesty Inter International concert, um, raising money for all kinds of cool things in Chicago, U2, the police, all, a whole bunch of cool stuff. We went to that, stayed up all night. The next day, jump on a plane, fly to San Francisco. I forgot all my bike clothes at his house. So I have my bike, and I'm wearing essentially, I have a couple swimsuits, a couple t-shirts, and six-month-old Chuck Taylors. That's it. Okay? Remember, I'm 16. So I start the trip with that. Go to Stanford. That night was graduation, so I was at somebody's apartment. I lay down on the floor, and I fall asleep and uh, wake up the next day and get ready for the trip. Two days later, we're on the road. California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, 75 miles a day average. And we get to outside Denver, and I get to the point of the book where he doesn't live in Kansas anymore. It's like, oh. So uh, he had moved to Atlanta with his wife. So one hour after reading this part of the book, I'm given the opportunity to switch to the southern route of the trip. So there are five routes going across the country, raising awareness and money. So I switched to the southern route. It starts in Texas, and it goes through Atlanta. And I'm like, Atlanta? Sign me up. So an hour later, I'm in a van. We're driving all night down to Dallas. Um, meanwhile, I'm using my mom's calling card to call Livgren's in the phone book. Remember, it's the 80s. And I'm just saying, information, can you give me Livgren in Topeka, Kansas, where Carrie was from? And I did a number of phone calls. And uh, remember, I'm 16. And I get Carrie's mom's number. She lived in Missouri. She calls him and uh, basically says, there's this kid biking across the United States who wants to meet you. And he's like, on a motorcycle? She says, no, on a bicycle. He's like, that's weird. Give him my number. So I get his number. When I get to Atlanta, I'm so excited. I'm going to meet my hero. And we would take a day off on the bike trip. This day off, we were going to meet Coretta Scott King at the King Center. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to stand her up. So we go to the King Center, but I'm not going to have a chance because Atlanta's very big. Carrie's over here, and I'm here, and I'm on a bike. And I'm not going to say, hey, Carrie, would you come pick me up? Uh, I'm not going to do that. So we called, or I called him. We had two conversations. Well, one of the conversations, he shared with me, probably the first one, that this is what you need to do in life. Work on a craft and do stuff that's bigger than yourself. Dedicate yourself to things bigger than yourself. Everybody can figure that out. And it was like, okay. So, and then at the end of one of the calls, or the first call, he goes, I need to go. My dinner's got the wife on, my wife on the table. And I was like, Harry and Wayward Son, Dustin Wynn, all these deep philosophical songs, and he's a really funny guy. So the point of this is that he's actually really silly. So, by the way, since our conversation, a few years later, he did move back to Kansas. He is there now. So all is right in the world. All right, so I finished the trip, the bike trip. All of us finished. We ended at the United Nations. We got an accommodation at the United Nations. By the way, if you want to piss off New Yorkers, have nine motorcycle police officers blocking traffic during lunch and then have 30 cyclists coming down waving. And I'll just say that most people are not waving with all their fingers. <laughs> I get a ride back to Wisconsin, and I was changed. I needed a craft to develop. I had that charge. I knew what I needed to do. But what? I started junior year looking to be of service to something bigger than myself, so I became a janitor at my high school. Now, it's Catholic school. I couldn't afford to go there. My church paid half my tuition. I worked off the other tuition by doing floors in the basement every weekend and cleaning the locker rooms in an all-guys high school. So um, I also worked on volunteering and doing different things at our school. So I became co-editor-in-chief with a good friend of mine, and we worked on a newspaper, and that was fun. I also joined Greenpeace and Amnesty International. I wanted to be a part of these organizations to see what I could do to be a positive change. All right. Now, I have a takeaway for you. Takeaway one. Now, imagine your students. Right? Imagine this punk is in your classroom, right? Sophomore, kind of trying to figure out life. You know, how do we know our kids? And one thing I do 
and I understand you probably, you may or may not be able to read the words here. I take pictures of the kids, print them out on a full piece of paper, and this is on the back of the page. Then I give this, this to them, and we go through some exercises to find out their learning styles, hobbies, and so on. I then memorize this information using the Leitner system. Now, we all know what this is. This is flashcards. But it's something that I haven't gotten really good at until recently, last couple years. The whole idea is I have to memorize all their names the first weekend, because we start school on Wednesday. And you need seven times to visit information at seven different intervals of time. And then you use this effect. So you look at the picture, don't know the name, flip it over, cool. And you d different piles. So I do this after school on Friday, Saturday morning, Saturday lunch, Saturday evening, Sunday morning, Sunday lunch, Sunday evening. Each time going through this to memorize the names. Then Monday morning, I test myself. This year it was 97.8%. That means three names I did not have, which is not acceptable. Because I'm, you're not going to be the kid in my class when I put all your pictures up on the screen and I'm pointing and saying all the names and then... No. So I drilled a little bit more. But the reason I'm telling you this is that we're expert learners and we're teaching emerging learners. This is a core strategy for me. Both this, whoops, and this. So this has been life changer because instead of looking at that kid in the back row, I know it's John. And I would know John has things about John. He's a hero. He's on his own journey. I'm not, it's not some kid. And he might not be my learning style. I might act out a little bit. That's fine. He's John. And I got to get to know him better. In fact, uh, Abraham Lincoln is known for saying, I don't like that guy. I got to get to know him better. Think of our politics if we could do that as well. So that's something I try to live by. So takeaway two, Cajun Koi Academy. Now, these brothers, let's talk about grades. If you're like me, you've tried taking study advice from other successful students. Luckily, my big bro went through medical school a few years before I did, so I got the juicy secrets. Don't take notes, study two hours a day, don't wake up early. But when I tried these tips, my grades got popped. Everything I knew about studying was wrong. I was trying to be... Now, you can continue to watch that on your own. It's in the slideshow, and the slideshow is linked in the Huva app, so... But these guys are amazing, and the learning strategies they put together are really helpful. So I share this with my students, but I also am using this stuff myself. So enjoy that. All right, second story. What we're going to do is we're going to go back across America. So I want to make a difference. Um, I need a craft to pursue. So at junior year of high school, I start searching for colleges. The Peterson Guide to Colleges, Peterson Guide to Colleges, the Peterson Guide to Colleges. Now, when you say that really fast, and this is what happens a lot to me, is people go, what did you just say? I'm like, <laughs> that book. Now, some people may remember. It's over 1,000 pages. It has all the colleges. Now, this is before the Internet. So if you wanted to research all the schools, you'd flip through this thing and look at it. Well, one day I go into my counseling center, and our counselors were great, and I got to know her really well because I was in there all the time looking. I pop the book down on a desk. It hits the spine and pops open to Evergreen. I was like... What's Evergreen? And she goes, oh, it's a really, really good school. I just read about this. And so I read it and was like, wow, this is really cool. I need to check this out. So I'm investigating where to go next. Where do I get the skills I'm going to need? And I also start experimenting with learning strategies. Now, I'm using language like this now, not as a junior because I had no idea what I was doing. I was a good student, but something wasn't quite right. Something was problematic with what I was doing. Memorizing stuff didn't make any sense to me because you'd memorize it for a short period of time, and then you'd forget it. So why was I learning this stuff? What was important about it? How's it going to help me get a craft? How's it going to help me make a difference? So um, I stopped cramming for tests. I took notes in class. I paid attention. But I stopped cramming for tests. And let's just say I was kicked off the National Honor Society the last quarter of my senior year because I would not change that. You know, I love my teachers and it was all that, but that part didn't, that didn't make sense to me. But I had begun this experimentation on there's got to be a better way to learn. Flash forward to 1994. I graduate from the Evergreen State College. Now what? I move back to Wisconsin because I, I love my home and so on and so forth. I move back there. I manage a small media company, uh, but I'm not satisfied. I come back out here to visit Olympia, meet friends because I've been here for four years and realize this is now my home. And so I decide to move back. On my way back, I'm in a Volkswagen van. Now you're like, wait, Evergreen, Volkswagen van? Yes, I bought it for 200 bucks. 
fried the electrical system, paid 600 bucks to fix that. My roommate friend and I drove back to Wisconsin in that van, and it saved us a lot of money from getting a U-Haul. Um, on the way back, I bought a, four, a Yamaha Special 2 400 motorcycle for my brother for 400 bucks, put that in the van and all my worldly possessions, hit the road, stopped in South Dakota, and a big blizzard was coming through. And the next morning, I get up, and I'm trying to stay ahead of the storm because they're closing the interstate. So I'm on I-90. I hit the road for Vermilion, and I'm, I'm driving down. Semi goes by me, sprays slush on the windshield, instant frozen mosaic. Volkswagen vans don't have any heat. The heat is supposed to come from the engine in the back and blow up in the front, and it never does. I now can't see the world. I'm doing 55 miles an hour, and I start rolling down the window, and I feel it start to slide. I'm like, uh-oh. And then I overcorrect. And then I'm sliding sideways, and I roll. I'm leaning on the side, the windshield popped out, the wipers are still going, the radio's still on. And I'm like, like all good 70s cop shows, the thing's going to blow up. I got to get out. So I jump out the windshield, I put on my little cowboy hat I had, and I'm like, is the top wheel still spinning? Anyway, I get a ride, we get help, get this uprighted, they drag me into Plankington, South Dakota, snow's coming down, I'm really dejected, and I'm sitting in the van with the windshield shoved in, and I'm like, well... Let's try something. So I take the windshield out, put it back on, go back in the engine compartment, upright the battery, and look and go, I wonder if it'll run. So I turn it over. It starts right up. Now, the mirrors are broke off, and the windshield shattered on the right side, but, you know, it's got the protective stuff, so it's still in one piece. And I try to put in gear and do a little figure eight. I'm like, hell with it. Back on the highway. So I drive for 400 miles. Then the engine dies because the generator wasn't charging the battery. And I coast for 17 miles, saying Hail Marys, and I found out that it wasn't this incredible spiritual event that my, my belief in, belief in Hail Marys is going to get me to Billings. It's just that when you're at the high plains, there's a point right at 17 miles outside of town that just slowly starts descending into town. I hit that at just the right spot and just coasted in my van. And there's only one spot I had to throw it in gear and lurch over a little hill and then continue my downhill glide. So... Eventually, I get back to Olympia, and I apply for jobs, and I'm working odd jobs, mowing lawns, doing things to pay the bills, and a decision to make. I get two job offers in the same week, manage manpower, which is going to pay three times as much as the second offer, which is tech support at Capitol High School. I like tech support, okay. But school looks cool. It's like this. In my, in my heart of hearts, I know one has soul and no money, and one has no soul and a lot of money. It's essentially how I saw it. So uh, after the interviews, I jump on my Yamaha 400, drive over the mountains, uh, my only vehicle. I ride to Chelan, and I start digging potatoes for a friend. And uh, I'm digging potatoes to you know, make eight bucks an hour so I can pay the bills. And I uh, get a phone call. And that phone call is Capital High School. They're like, hey, we want to hire you. Come on back. I was like, wow. So I come back. I joined them as full-time tech support. And uh, I'm working tech support. And an English teacher comes up to me, strangles me, not unconscious. She pushes me against the wall. <sighs> Remember, it's the 90s. I guess you could do that. And she says to me, you're wasting your talent. You should be a teacher. Now, Cynthia Dickinson is, is pretty awesome. She's a battle axe of a woman. And uh, she means what she says. Uh, that really shook me. And so I get emergency certified, take the elements of teaching class at Central, and uh, learned about total quality learning from those two teachers that ran that class. I was like, this is amazing stuff. Quality and systems, plan with people, not for people, find purpose, make a difference. Like, who are these people? And so I became a CTE teacher. And uh, we all rock. Now, so that's the end of my second story. And um, we're going to do a little quiz. Now, it's not really a quiz. It's more like a, a test for you to do. This is where you get active. You have paper on your tables, and what we're going to do is this. I probably should stay close to the mic. I would like you to get a pen or pencil and a piece of paper. So there's a little square piece of paper on your table you can use. You can write on anything. This activity involves writing three words and 27 numbers, twice. Very simple activity, but it's profound, and I think it will help you with your students. By the way, you can write on anything, so if you have a, a fellow staff member who doesn't mind you writing on their arm, 
but they're cool with it. All right, for those people who read, read ahead, you'll notice you're also going to need a timer. So this could work as a timer. Now, here's the thing. I'm not going to run, run a timer up here because it's really confusing when you do it with larger groups. I've done this with my classes, and it's, it can be frustrating. So here's the thing. You're going to set a timer to count up, and then when you are done writing, you'll stop and see what time, you know, how long it took to do this first exercise. We're doing this twice. So now, you don't, don't start yet because... You just need a timer to track how long it's going to take you to do this. I think seeing it makes more sense than me trying to explain it. You're going to write the words first. Multitasking is switch tasking. Then you're going to write the numbers under each letter. There's 27 numbers, 27 letters. So letters first, then numbers. And you're setting a timer before you start. And then you're going to let the timer roll. Write the letters, write the words, stop the timer. Okay, go ahead and do that now. All right, so you want to write down that number. The second thing you're going to do, the same exercise with a profound difference, okay? Now, you can turn the paper over, you can write on the same piece of paper, it doesn't matter. The difference is this. It's better if I show you. Letter, number, letter, number, letter, number. You have to do it in that order. Letter, number, letter, number, that for the same words you wrote and the same numbers. But you're gonna set a timer, hit go, and go letter, number, letter, number, letter, number. Okay? Go ahead and do that now, please. It's so much quieter. <laughs> As you can already hear, if you want to talk amongst your tables, which one took you longer? By how much? And if you do the percentage on that, we'll talk about that percentage. You don't have to do the percentage now, but just talk amongst yourselves about what you noticed.
Let's bring it back together. I've got one more thing I want to share with you, and then we'll be done. So can somebody give me a, a difference in time? Who's a brave volunteer, just like, how long did it take you for the first one? How long did it take you for the second one? Yeah, right over here. I love the point numbers. That's, I mean, you, we're in the right room for that. Like, if you're going to measure it, measure it accurately. So somebody else? One more? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what you'll find uh, is about, it, it ranges depending, but 20-some percent worse performance on the second one, all the way up to 50-some percent, and you'll find that that kind of, that's what we represent. So we cannot multitask efficiently. Now, for our wonderful little cherubs in school, uh, or anybody else who's a naysayer about, no, I can multitask, try this activity. Because what you're asking the brain to do is two different things and to switch between them, and you feel it. Uh, you know, the higher error rate, error rate goes up by 50%. It usually takes up to twice as long, potentially. So the idea is if you want to be efficient, you want to get something done, you have to do one thing at a time. We can monotask really, really well. As soon as you ask us to do two things at once, that drops tremendously. So, again, when, it just doesn't mean anything when it comes out of the mouth of a teacher, but if you feel it yourself, you're like... Oh. So all of a sudden that science starts to come home really quickly with an activity like this. So that's a, a giveaway for you, a takeaway, that if I would implore you to try it and then have a conversation in your classes about efficiency, about satisfaction, happiness, and so on, because all these things kind of tie together. If we're trying to get somewhere that we really want to get there, but we're tying an arm or a leg behind our back with our brain by trying to do the thing we really want to do, you know, that seems a little asinine. So hopefully that's helpful. Okay, takeaway number three piece of paper that's been on your table uh, this whole time is something created by Dan Harmon. It's based on the hero's journey. He simplified it down to an eight-point story circle. Now, if you've noticed in my slideshow, I had the numbers permeating throughout it. That's this. So my two stories are two hero's journey stories using a story circle. So if you go back to the slideshow, you can see each one of these pieces is represented. All of us have hero journey stories all day. I mean, it could have been about breakfast today. If you look at this process, this process works really well to grab our attention. We're going to watch something, and we're going to end on this. Uh, about six minutes, this gentleman looked at Carl Jung's research that Joseph Campbell then wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and then Dan Harmon simplified it into the story circle, and then this guy kind of brings it all together to explain how our stories work and that we love these types of stories. So here we go. Human society runs on stories. They create our reality the way we as individuals see the world. They make us sad, they make us happy, they inspire us. It's no surprise that Hollywood TV and books bring in hundreds of billions of dollars each year. It's no surprise that the entire nation except for Ohio was rooting for the Cubs. The eternal underdogs finally had their shot. It's why day in, day out, most people want to live the best story they can. We love good stories. At this point in human history, it feels like there are infinite stories. I'm told they're all different. But what if I told you the basic structure of all of those stories is the same? I'm not talking about the stuff that ends up making them different, like style. Just a basic structure for every story that's ever been recognizable as a story. Well, many people have tried different formulas, but perhaps no one has done it better than the widely respected philosopher and theologian Joseph Campbell. He developed the monomyth, also known as the hero's journey, which he lays out in his masterwork, A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, it wasn't a screenwriting book. It was just a book about a guy who grew up a Boy Scout and a Catholic who was really passionate about these Native American stories, who started noticing similarities between parables about Christ and like these Native American folk tales that predated Christ and also had no way of, of, of being touched by Christian uh, culture. So he started, you know, his, his, his life work Came comparative mythology, and mythology doesn't isn't just stories around a campfire. It's 
it's pop music it's it's the dream you're describing to your friend on the subway it's 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 drawings on a napkin it's 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 basically everything indeed after years and years of studying campbell concluded there are characteristics of an effective story and those characteristics are consistent regardless of religion race time or ancestry it's nothing short of genius but what if you could simplify his monomyth into an even more basic structure one that helps anyone build a story well, Dan Harmon, who we were just listening to, did exactly that. He created the Story Circle, a distillation of the monomyth into eight steps. He believes his circle is universal for any story in any medium. Before we get to the eight steps he sets out, I want to bring the circle back to its most basic form to first understand the theory behind it. So we have a circle, and we draw a horizontal line through it. The top of the circle represents where the character's journey starts and finishes. The bottom represents the world that needs to be traversed in order to grow and change. In a basic sense, this is the ordinary world, and this is the special world. So why this ritual of descent and return? Well, for Harmon, every story has a rhythm or balance. He lays out three dualities to explain this. The first being life and death. Take, for example, the story of life. You're alive, and then you're dead. Then your dead body decomposes and feeds plants, giving new life, which then dies. That's a story. It goes back and forth. They rely on each other. A balance is needed for things to happen. Same goes for the next one he lays out. Consciousness and unconsciousness. Upstairs in your consciousness, things are comfortable, well lit, and regularly swept. Downstairs in the basement is your unconscious, where it's older, darker, and much freakier. It's the stuff you don't, won't, and or can't think about. However, your pleasure, your sanity, and even your life depend on occasional round trips. Ventures by the ego into the unconscious through therapy, meditation, confession, sex, violence, or a good story keep the conscious in working order. Just like the health of an individual depends on the ego's regular descent and return to and from the unconscious, a society's longevity depends on actual people journeying into the unknown and returning with ideas. In their most dramatic, revolutionary form, these people are called heroes. But every day, society is replenished by millions of people diving into darkness and emerging with something new or forgotten. To Harmon, all stories follow this pattern of descent and return, of diving and emerging. As he says, all life, including the human mind and the communities we create, marches to the same specific beat. If the story marches to this beat, it will resonate. It will send an audience's ego on a brief trip to the unconscious and back. The audience has an instinctive taste for that, and they're going to say, yum. But how does one venture between these dualities in order to create a story? Let's build the rest of our circle. We draw a vertical line down the center. Now we have four intersections and four spaces, or quadrants. Starting at the top and going clockwise, we number the four points where the lines cross the circle. One, three, five, and seven. Now we number the quarter sections themselves. Two, four, six, eight. Each number has a label, and they'll take us through the story piece by piece. One, you. A character is in a zone of comfort. Two, need. They want something. Three, go. They enter an unfamiliar situation. Four, search adapt to it five find get what they wanted six take pay a heavy price for it seven return then return to their familiar situation eight change having changed now each of the semicircles has an important meaning crossing from one half to the other these are major sources of drama in the story from top to bottom you delineate the moment that the hero enters a new situation and is forced to adapt often struggling to do so. This usually means that the protagonist fights some external force. The second line is defining the inner struggle of the hero. Once the hero crosses this dividing line, he or she finally faces and tries to overcome his or her inner flaws or problems. If we took, for example, Die Hard, we'd have failing marriage and terrorist attack. And left to right, we might have stubborn, not stubborn. Once he descends and returns to here, McLean, no longer stubborn, now has the power to change his failing marriage. In simplest terms, order chaos, stasis, change. Now that we have our circle ready, I'd like to apply it to a well-known story, Star Wars Episode You have to finish this on your own. But if you flip the paper over, the Star Wars example is on the backside. 
so you can see Luke on his adventure and so on. Uh, I also have more resources related to this on my class blog, so you can go to that and check that out if you'd like. But to wrap up today, or this morning, I want to know, I, I, I challenge you with this, like, what is your hero's journey? And, and journeys, we do, just all day, every day, um, that have taken you to be where you are, and how did that come about? And what are your students' heroes' journeys? And if we think about it this way, we can look at life at a little, with a, just like from a side glance and kind of go, wow, I'm off on these adventures. And if I'm not going into the dark side to figure out who I am, maybe I'm not pushing hard enough. I'm not challenging myself enough. And since we love the structure, we're just, we're just wired for it. If we pitch our stories with this kind of a structure, people are going to receive it better. And that's another thing for us. If we want to be heard, we have to say it in a way that can be processed. We're wired for this. So it helps us put our stories in a little bit more dramatic uh, fashion. So I'm going to skip over the questions, but you know where I am. I'll be here all day today. Um, try the veal. It's great. And uh, thank you for being here. And have a great conference. Thank you, just from WIT oh. for speaking. Oh, thank you very yeah, much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So. All right. All right. Real, real quick before you guys take off, I got a couple, a couple updates. Um, check your Whova app if you're not already uh, already on it. Please download it and check it. Uh, that is the digital version of our grid that we have for you downstairs. Because uh, we've had, we have had a couple room changes, so make sure you're checking in with that. Find out where your sessions are. Make sure you take the time to go visit with the vendors uh, down the exhibit hall downstairs. Um, if you are presenting, please make sure that you're uh, given your next session enough time to set up and you are hitting record on your Zoom. That's how we're going to make sure that we have this for everybody that's uh, coming in remote. And then the awards banquet dinner is at 6 o'clock in here tonight. Uh, please make sure you come and attend that so we can recognize those people that have been doing some awesome work. And then the uh, last couple things that I have for you, scan those QR codes for the Bob Radabaugh and the Classroom Vegas grants. Uh, we want to give you guys the stuff, that you, uh, the money that you need to make some really awesome programs. And then if you have not registered for the conference clock hours, which are separate from pre-con, make sure you check in with Francine downstairs to register with that. So if you attended pre-con, and that's the only time you've signed in, you need to sign in again to get the 15 for the actual conference. Go have fun. Hopefully we learned something. <laughs>